Hello everyone, my name is Sue Shardlow. I'm the Developer Community Manager here at Redis. Thanks so much for joining us here on Twitch today or watching our video if you are looking at the recording on YouTube. Today I am doing a one-to-one -one fireside chat with Caitlin, but before I bring her onto the stream, I just want to talk to you a little bit, why, bit about why we're doing this. So, as you may know, uh, October is the month of Hacktoberfest, which as the name suggests, is a month long festival of open source. It's sponsored by Digital Ocean, and um, it aims to get folks involved in open source quite often for the first time. And so here at Redis, we are participating in um, Oktoberfest. We've made available a lot of issues on our various repos, demo apps, and even some of the actual uh, SDKs and things like that. Uh, that people can get involved with contributing to. But one of the ways that folks often cite as a sort of a gentle way to get into open source is via documentation. And the reason for that is a lot of folks find it quite scary to go and look for a code base to contribute to and then go and uh, open a pull request against that repo. So a lot of people do recommend that documentation is a good way to get into open source for the first time. And for that reason, I decided as part of the project that I'm running here at Redis for Hacktoberfest that I would run some little information sessions for you to demystify the world of technical writing and documentation. So what we've done so far is here at Redis, we've got a documentation team. It's got three people in, Lance, Caitlin and Rachel. And a week or so ago, we did a little panel fireside chat here on Twitch recording is up on YouTube you want to go check that out and um, so we just talked about technical writing generally and documentation generally and you know just what it's all about and just sort of briefly how to get into it and what it involves and what we're doing this week is we are sitting down on a one-to-one -one basis I've been really lucky to be able to get some time in all of the documentation team's diaries to sit down with them on a one-to-one -one basis and really look at their particular journey because they've all got different backgrounds they've all come to this team from different places with different skills and different industries different companies um you know different things that they took academically and things like that all different skills and knowledge that they brought to the role so I wanted to sit down with them individually to really get those stories and hopefully inspire some of you to look at technical writing and maybe consider it as a career too because it's quite clear that you can come at it from a lot of different places. So today um, I'm speaking to Caitlin Michael. Tomorrow I'm speaking to uh, Rachel Elledge. So that's tomorrow, Tuesday the 26th of October. And then on Friday the 29th of October, I'm sitting down with Lance Leonard, who manages the documentation team. And all of these sessions are at the same time live on Twitch as today. So that's 9am Pacific, noon Eastern, 4pm UTC and 5pm UK and if you're watching on YouTube then um, yes we'll put the recordings up very soon and they will be there forever so you just catch them whenever you want but that's if you want to catch the live uh, showings that's when they'll be and please do feel free to if you're watching live to type any questions in the chat we will be using the premiere function on YouTube so if you catch a premiere well if you subscribe to us on YouTube you'll get a notification when we premiere the videos and there'll also be an opportunity to uh, ask any questions in the live chat which we will answer um, in the text chat because obviously we can't work that into the videos retrospectively so that is what is coming up if you want to know any more about what we're doing for Hacktoberfest please look at developer.redis.com slash Hacktoberfest you'll find all the information about what we're doing and all the available issues there and you'll also see, be able to go and have a look at some of the pull requests we've had. It's been really cool. We do have a video on YouTube where I and Simon, who manages developer advocacy here at Redis, went through some of the pull requests to highlight some of the really great work people have submitted to the Redis repos during Hacktoberfest. So do check that out on YouTube. OK, so that is all the preamble for today. Let's bring Caitlin into the stream. I, today I've got Caitlin Michael with me. She's a technical writer here on the Redis Docs team. Hi, Caitlin. How are you today? Hi, Suze. I'm good. How about you? 
Yeah, I'm not bad, thanks. It's right at the end of my day here. So uh, I put my lamp on because I know sunset is going to be very soon and it's going get, to be getting darker and darker. And I don't want to be sitting here in the dark at the end because it's going to be really obvious if I need to switch the light on. But your day's just beginning there, isn't it? Yeah, it's um, a little before lunchtime. So uh, yeah, just starting this. So yeah, your uh, your light's only going to get better when mine is quickly fading. But uh, yeah, it's really good to to have you on the stream today. So I'm really looking forward to this chat because I know you've got a really, really interesting background and a really uh, interesting journey to hear. So let's start with that then. Let's kind of set the scene for this, this fireside chat. So tell me about your journey and how you got to where you are now. So you're a technical writer here at Redis in the documentation team. Tell us a bit about your journey and how you got to, to where you are now. Um, okay, so I went to um, a four-year university here in Wisconsin and I was an English literature major. Um, and I kind of specialized in um, uh, film theory and uh, I did a lot of research and um, I just really loved it and I love the written word, and I thought that maybe I was going to go and become a PhD professor. Um, but by the time I was done with, you know, I was ready to graduate. I was like, I can't, can't do, can't do this. So um, I started looking for other opportunities, and I kind of stumbled into a technical writing role. Um, I actually. My first job was at um, the place because I applied because my mom made me um, because it, she worked at that company and she was like, just apply, just just humor me, just apply. And um, I got an interview and um, they were really impressed with my research skills, how fast I could pick things up. Um, also, the fact that I was um, fluent in Adobe software and they were just looking for a new college grad who was willing to learn, and that was me. And so I started at um, a supercomputer company called Cray, and I started writing about um, things I had absolutely no idea how they worked. Um, I was writing instruction manuals for supercomputers, these things that you know calculate weather patterns and climate change and the cure for cancer and everything. They're, they're, I was just like kind of in awe of the technology that I was working on. Um, and I picked things up really fast and I really enjoyed learning new things every day, um, talking to some of the smartest people I've ever met. And um, it was just a really great career. And so I decided that that's what I wanted to pursue, that this is actually what I want to do. So um, I got two or three promotions and um, learned more. I said I went back to school for computer science for a couple semesters part time. Um, and I just soaked up all the information that I could take. And, and then I ended up here at Redis and um, all the things that I learned at Cray um, helped me get this job. And same thing here. I'm just soaking up all the information, learning all that I can and eventually, you know, becoming more knowledgeable than other people on certain subjects, which is r really crazy to think because I was an English major. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So you you went to college to take an English degree, and you specialised in film. So, uh, but you said that when you joined the company that your mum made you apply to because you weren't there, um, you already had familiarity with like Adobe software. Mm -hmm. But how, how how would you say your technical knowledge was before you joined that company? Oh, my technical knowledge was absolutely none. Um, I had. A little bit of HTML. Um, I had tried designing a website before, but I'd never been successful. Um, and uh, that was about it. Um, luckily, they were looking for somebody to make um, hardware diagrams, and I was fluent in Adobe Illustrator. And so that's what I did um, for my first few years there. And then I eventually kind of um, learned more and went into the software side of things. and. Then I was teaching people how to administer entire rooms of servers. Wow. Okay. 
That that is really that is not the answer I expected actually. And what's really interesting to me there is you've touched upon the different types of documentation. So where you started off was you were drawing the diagrams, um, and you you didn't consider yourself to be very technical at all. You also said earlier on that you got a couple of promotions. So um, I'm quite interested to hear about that. So that was within the same company. Yes. And obviously, within the realm of technical writing, you can actually progress. Can you talk to us a little bit, a bit about what those progressions involved or what they could involve for somebody that does get into the technical writing field? Because you do hear about the job titles and a lot of them just say technical writer. It doesn't necessarily say senior technical writer or give some sort of specialism with it. So talk to us about that. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the size of your team. So like. At Redis, we have three technical writers. We have a documentation lead, Lance, and then we have Rachel and I. And Rachel and I have different experience levels, but we have the same title because there's only three of us. Um, at my previous company, there was, I think, at 1.16 writers. Um, and so we had associate writer, we had a writer one, a writer two, and then a senior writer. And then eventually they added on a project manager um, above senior writer. So it was a, a way that you could go into, you could continue your career progression without managing people. Um, and I started out as an associate writer straight out of college. And, um, I, in like a year and a half, I was, um, progressed to, uh, writer one. And when I was a writer, one is when they switched me into software. Previously, I'd been doing hardware. Um, and I just kind of, it was, I hate to say copy and paste, but I would get all of the information that I needed from somebody who knew what they were talking about. And then I would just make it presentable. Um, and, but I was learning as I was going and learning to ask the right questions. And that's how I got the promotions. And then I became one of the youngest, I became the youngest um, writer too at the company um, because they technically wanted somebody with five years of experience in order to qualify to be a writer too, but I was promoted when I had four. Um, and I really just like made a case that I was doing everything a writer two was doing. And so the, Differences at my previous company between writer one and writer two um, were the projects that you were taking on and the initiative that you were taking and the amount of like project management that you were doing. So um, when I was an associate writer, I just like got my assignments from my boss. I, you know, did it and, you know, moved on. It was kind of an assignment, you know, basis. And then once I became a writer one, they just gave me an area of responsibility and it was my job to determine what needed to be documented and um, who could talk who I could talk to about that and what it should look like um, and kind of design the project myself and the writer too was just they gave me a bigger area of responsibility so I was responsible for multiple documents um, and multiple areas of the of the product and then senior writer is um, somebody, I think they, in their like job specifications, it was like 10 years of experience. Um, and that's somebody who just like really knows what they're doing and is able to like mentor um, younger writers and, or, you know, less experienced writers. And um, they have a lot of product domain knowledge. So with each of these levels, um, they also required you to know a certain amount about the product so that you didn't have to rely on your engineers asking them questions over and over again. You could kind of figure things out yourself. So as a writer too, I tested some of my own procedures, um, which is really scary on a um, development machine that they're, yeah, so we, we only had access to development machines that they were actually using to test the software. And um, they were like, just don't screw it up because it'll set us back a month. And I was like, <laughs> so scared. <laughs> so I was very cautious with that. But um, yeah, so it's really about the the size of the, the documentation area that you're responsible for, the amount of responsibility that you have 
in that project and the amount of knowledge that you have about it. Yeah, it sounds like they were really well organized with documentation in that company as well, because you you get a very large spectrum of how seriously a company takes its documentation, I think. There are some companies that don't have a documentation team at all. There are some companies that don't even have any technical writers. So they're relying on the technicians that, you know, the software and hardware people to write some documentation. And sometimes that doesn't get done. So it sounds like you were quite fortunate that in your first role, so you came in as an associate, there was a very clear career path for you because you were in a large team, you were in a team of 16 people, and you could clearly see this is what the job that they hold and this is what I need to do to get there. And it sounds like you proved that as well because you got promoted earlier than um, they would normally promote somebody. You got promoted a year earlier uh, because you could see what others were doing and what you needed to achieve to get that role. And you decided, right, I'm going to go, go ahead and, and do that and get promoted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke for quite a long time there, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So did you actually, did you actually consciously look at these people and think, right, okay, that's the job I want to do because it's, it's, you sort of fell into it, didn't you? Yeah, I sort of fell into it, but then I, I really fell in love with it because the thing that I like about being a technical writer is that you never write the same thing twice because uh, you're either, you're always adding new information, stuff that is just being developed that no one else has information about. And so you're like bringing this information into the world kind of. And um, so you're always learning something new. You're always expanding on what you know. Um, even like right now, I am taking online courses to learn more about my um, area of expertise within Redis. And it's, I just really like that. No two days. I mean, the process is the same and the people that you work with are the same, but the content is never the same. Yeah. And I think a lot of people can't say that about their jobs. A lot of the time, you know, days are the same or you seem to be grinding out the same stuff all the time, but it's true. Like you say, if the text changing, then the documents have to change, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, no, that is really interesting, and I'm glad that you found somewhere for your first writing role that that did show you the available stuff. Because I, I don't know, did you know that technical writing was a job that you could do before you got got exposed to it in that way? So technical writing was like an emphasis within our English department um, that you could do. Um, one of my coworkers at Cray, she was in a technical writing major and, you know, she went through the whole thing. Um, and I, I kind of, I, I cursed, like sort of cursory knew that it was writing manuals and it did not sound like a good time. Um, and so I really didn't think that that was what I wanted to do. Yeah, no, I, can, I see what you mean, because, you know, if you pick up some of these manuals that you get, it doesn't look like it's a fun job to create one, does it? Mm. Um, but I remember um, in the panel interview that we did uh, a week or so ago that I mentioned earlier, you, I think you said that you, in previous roles, you had created different contents. It wasn't just about writing um, documentation and tutorials and stuff. I think you said that you did videos and stuff with, you know, a lot of photographs and things like that. Can you talk to me about that? Um, yeah, so when I was a hardware writer, um, it's nearly impossible to write good documentation without pictures for hardware um, because you would have to specify things like, you know, the screw on the top right. Um, and it's not very clear. So a picture and an illustration, a diagram um, was always very useful. And I worked with our graphic designer um, to help her with the videos. Um, she did all the editing, but like I helped with the shoot because I'm tall and I can hold lights. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, yeah, I learned, I learned a lot about like the video production part of it. We, um, inserted videos into some of our, um, actual documents. Like you could click on it from the PDF. Um, but mostly it was a lot, it was a lot of photos making sure that they're, they were clear. Um, that you had drawn attention to the right things and that you were describing you were describing it correctly 
and that the photo was really representative because it was, you know, there's a lot of small parts on a computer server board and um, they all look the same and a lot of them are the same. And uh, there's a lot of damage that you could do very easily. So <laughs> you had to be really, I had to be very intentional with um, the content that I put out there so that people weren't damaging these, you know, thousands of dollars worth of computer parts. That's true, actually. And I hadn't really thought of that, the distinction between software and hardware, because, you know, people often say when you're learning to code, don't be afraid to try because you can't break it. But with the hardware, that's very much not the case. Like somebody could short circuit something and completely blow it up and then they would have to buy a new one because you can't really buff that out, can you? <laughs> you yeah. can't, can't well, that. One example I have is that like um, the, you know, processor, the Intel processor, um, it's gold plated on the bottom and you had to use a suction tool to place it into the socket and then um, secure it. And if you moved it or scraped it at all, you would ruin the entire processor. And so, and we practiced on stuff from module assembly. So these were things that were going out to customers and they just let me play with it first. So um, I had to be very careful about that. Yeah, yeah, I guess to some extent you're like the user zero, aren't you? I mean, they have mm -hmm. tested this stuff, but they need somebody who knows how to explain it to also test it because you can't explain it unless you've tried it yourself, I guess. Mm -hmm. So you know how it feels. So you can kind of describe like, wait until you hear a click or something like that. You need a positive contact with this thing before you start to move it. Yeah, no, I hadn't really thought of that because I've only really thought about the software side of documentation. So that's interesting. What's also interesting to me is when you said you were tall, because although Caitlin and I work in the same team, we've never met in the flesh. So that'll be interesting whenever we get to travel again. And because uh, I'm really short, so uh, <laughs> on, on the stream, we're the same height. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm quite pleased about doing the virtual events. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so with all of this, I think that the thing that kind of binds it all together, you described to me before, um, the way that you talk about what you do is that you translate engineer. And I think that is something that is the same, regardless of what you're trying to explain. So talk to me about that. You know, what what do you mean when you say you translate engineer and how do you do it? I think it's probably hard to explain how you do it, but tell me a bit about that. So I always tell people when they ask what technical writing is that I translate engineer because it's not only that, you know, the engineers aren't trained writers and, you know, they don't know about readability and, um, you know, SEO and stuff like that, but also they take a lot of information that they have for granted. So, um, you know, they skip a lot of steps because it seems obvious. It seems obvious to them. And then you bring in this English major <laughs> and she's, I'm just like, what did you just do? Um, <laughs> And they're like, oh, well, you know, that's pretty standard. And I was like, no, it's, it's not obvious. <laughs> um, and so that's what big part is that we identify the pieces that um, they just assume everyone knows. And we ask the right questions and ask, well, what happens if, if you do this? And they're like, well, you'll get an error and you'll need to reboot it. Well, we don't have that written down. So we need to write that down um those kinds of questions and also to just um kind of simplify the language a lot of um engineers use a ton of jargon and um three letter acronyms are running rampant um in engineering writing and they want an acronym for everything they even have a three letter acronym for the phrase three letter acronym <laughs> and it's true <laughs> Um, and so they would just assume that you knew what you would, they were talking about. And in documentation, at the very least, we define it in the first time we use it. And then we can use the acronym to shorten, you know, because really long stuff isn't the greatest. So they're useful in some cases, but sometimes they're just not necessary. Um, and so a lot of the things, again, that they assume are common knowledge we really question and make sure that it's user-friendly and we think about the audience 
does the audience know this? I know you know it because you made it, but um, do the people that have never seen this before, do they know what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. And I can imagine that can vary according to the person that you're speaking to because some engineers, I imagine, are very good at explaining what they do. And probably some of them could write the documentation. Mm -hmm. Others are probably just not as practiced at it do you find that sometimes, you know, when you're speaking to somebody and asking them to explain about their product, that they're not explaining it to you in a way that you understand? Yeah, um, it's generally people that have been doing the same thing for like a long time and they are just like, well, it's just this. It's, it, you know, it's it just happens this way. And I'm like, yeah, but you need to explain it to me. And they're like, oh, well, they should know this. And you're like, yeah, I, I think we should explain it. Um, but yeah, there is a there's a pretty wide like view on technical writing. Some people viewed us as an annoyance and we were asking too many questions and wasting their time. And some people were super grateful to have a technical writing team because then the burden of documentation wasn't on them. And um, a lot of people, more than not, um, engineers are ridiculously helpful and willing to take the time to explain basic concepts to you. Um, the number of times that an engineer took an hour of his time to explain something to me that um, most other people in his team, it would take two minutes to explain. Um, that happened quite often and was really huge. So it kind of varies between people. I mean, people, you know, their view on documentation and we're really, the drive for the technical writing department is always to include documentation as the definition of done. So we want, we don't want to be behind where they're like, it's finished. Okay, now you can write about it. We want to be writing about it as they're developing it. And so the documentation is done when the product's done and they don't consider it done until it's documented. I like that. Yeah. So on that, speaking to what you just said, at what stage in the whole product life cycle do you as technical writers get involved? I mean, ideally, very near the beginning or, you know, before the beginning, but at what stage do you generally get involved? Um, it really depends on, again, like the resources that you have. So when I was on a bigger team, um, I was in their scrum meetings. I was in every meeting. I was listening to everything. And even though most of it didn't apply to me, um, I still had an eye out for does that need to be documented? Does that need to be documented? Um, and so as they were developing this and they were, um, you know, planning their sprints, they were planning their releases, they were saying, okay, we're going to do these three features, then I would be planning how that would change the documentation. And um, very soon after they figured out how they were going to do it, I would be like, okay, how, what, how is it going to work? And then of course things change. Um, so they had to, you know, they have to be like, well, this variable is now this variable and you have to go and change things. Um, and then that way we could get a review of it before it needed to go out the door. So um, yeah, it's, but now in a smaller company, um, a lot of times we're, we're still trying to be in step with the de development, but you know, we have a lot more area to cover. So we generally kind of um, sync more with product management than with R&D. And they tell us what's important so that we don't have to waste our time, you know, sitting in meetings and, and lurking for bits of information. We really want people to tell us if something needs to change. We really want people to show us, you know, we're thinking about you and um, we're gonna keep you updated. So, um, where the product managers at Redis are really great about that and they um, keep us up to date on how the release is going. We, you know, um, try to get things done before the release or so it can release at the same time or shortly after. They help us prioritize stuff if we can't. Um, so it really depends on 
the amount of resources you have. If you have a dedicated technical writer for every document, then um, they can get involved a lot easier earlier. Yeah, yeah. I love what you said there. It's not done until it's documented. And I really loved where you said that, you know, where, where you worked before, you were able to get in there right at the beginning and follow along with them and say, right, do we need to document this or and that? But I also recognise what you said about um, you, you can't always do that if you're in a smaller team and you've got a lot more different projects. Um, and there's a disadvantage that you pointed out which was that you're always on high alert, trying to glean little bits and pieces and trying to figure out for yourself what's important. Um, so you kind of want a happy balance between the two, don't you? You want to be involved early mm -hmm. on enough that you can influence how it's going to be done, um, but not so early that you're having to make a lot of the decisions and really kind of, you know, which aren't sometimes your decisions to make. You really kind of want somebody to actually make that call and then just say to you, this is what we need to do, and then kind of tweak it rather than, you know, actually set it all out from the beginning. So, yeah, that is that is super interesting. And it reminds me of when I worked in communication supporting IT rollout. So not necessarily documentation, but more about getting people to buy into it. I was often sitting in those meetings as well, listening out for things that I thought might be useful. Because like you say, sometimes people, um, they know what they think is obvious, but it's not obvious to everybody. What's obvious to you is only obvious to you, really, isn't it? It's not obvious to everybody else. So, um, so yeah, it takes a lot of mental energy. Um, and if you're not too familiar with something, it can be quite hard. So in terms of familiarity, then, just thinking specifically about Redis, I guess, um, how much did you know about Redis? before you join the company? Because I think that, you know, people might be looking at jobs and thinking, oh, I could do that job, but right, I've never used that technology before. Um, so realistically, you know, how much do you need to know about a technology before you can go and apply for a job documenting it? I had never used Redis before. I'm still not great with it. <laughs> um, uh, and I didn't like understand the reach that Redis had. So Kyle in our um, interview had to be like, people know Redis, it's a thing. And I was like, oh, good to know. Um, and so it's, um, you don't really have to know the technology. Um, if you come in at a higher level, um, they want you to be able to figure it out. So I had a basic knowledge of um, what databases were and how they worked. And um, I had a basic knowledge of um, Kubernetes and how that worked and um, Linux. And, and um, you put all those building blocks together and then you don't need to know the specific software because you can learn it on the job. That's, it's impossible not to learn it on the job because you are writing instructional material. And um, so sometimes I ended up learning really advanced stuff before the basics because I was writing because of what I was writing. Um, but yeah, I didn't have any familiarity with Redis before I started. And um, now I'm on one of our most complicated projects, so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I agree with you. Unless you are working in the back end a lot, then you might not have heard of Redis, but it is a big thing. So yeah, if you're in databases and back end and stuff like that, you you probably have heard of it. And I was the same because I haven't worked in back end specifically. So uh, yeah, I totally feel you on that. So if you didn't know about Redis specifically, then tell me a bit about what your onboarding looked like because you joined a little bit before me and so I wasn't here when you when you joined uh, what was that like you know how was that set up for you and what was the learning curve like um it was a really I think a really good onboarding um I my first day I came on and I had an onboarding plan document that I got to look at and um he had laid out all of the um resources that I might want to look at, um, the tutorials on Redis and the, um, the places on our website to look and the people that I would want to get to know in the coming months and their roles. And um, then also like what I should be accomplishing in the first week, in the first month, in the first quarter. 
Um, so it was fantastic to have that laid out and um, know, because a lot of times you come in and, and they're just like, well, just play around with it or like, <laughs> um, you know, just, just get a feel for it. <laughs> and um, you just kind of have to dive in. And so, yeah, my first um, probably month was just a lot of learning. Um, I also had to learn our tools because um, I had never worked in Markdown. I had previously worked in XML. So um, I, it was a new format to learn, um, new tools. I'd never worked in GitHub before. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a strong learning curve. Like it's really steep. But like I said, you, if you're doing your job, you're learning because you have to. <laughs> In order, yeah. if you don't understand what you're writing, then you're not writing it clearly. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? That's true. You need to be able to consume your own documentation um, and be able to use it. So in terms of the actual sort of training or any sort of resources that you use to kind of get up to speed, um, I know you said there were some technologies that you, you definitely needed some training on. Can you tell me a little bit about the training courses that you took to, to get up to speed and kind of what to what level, I guess, you decided you needed to be to be able to do the documentation for those particular bits? I think you mentioned Kubernetes. Yeah, so um, I still don't fully understand Kubernetes. It's very complicated. Um, basically, I where I see as I can stop researching and start doing that point is where I think I have all the information for this piece that I'm working on now. So if I'm working on, um, you know, something for our, our cloud product and it's about how to manage users and um, control access. So then I go and learn about um, ACLs and RBAC and, um, all the ways that we can do that in our product and the caveats that that might be and um, enough so that I understand what I'm writing. And so I am taking a course on Kubernetes because Kubernetes is very complicated. And I ask my engineers a lot of questions and some of them might seem obvious to them. Um, but again, they're not obvious to everyone. And so I try to make sure that I have at least a base level of understanding and I understand how the procedure that I'm doing works, even if I don't understand the architecture underneath it. So I don't have to know all of how computing works. I just have to know that, you know, you set this parameter and it changes this and you set this parameter and it changes this and I can convey that clearly. Yeah, you definitely have to be comfortable with not knowing everything to do this job is the sense that I'm getting from yes. you. Um, there definitely has to be some level of abstraction because it's not realistic to expect you to know everything about the product. The only person who knows everything about the product is the person who invented it and maintains it. After all, nobody else can really know. Um, so, yeah, so with that in mind, then the documentation that you're currently writing at Redis who is it aimed at? Like what sort of level? Because I'm assuming the people that are using your documentation probably know more about the product than we do because they use it all the time, right? So, mm -hmm. so tell us a bit about the target audience. So the target audience for the product that I'm working on is um, uh, Redis software or Redis enterprise software for Kubernetes. So Redis Enterprise software is more complicated than our cloud product because you have to do a lot of um, server administration. You have to worry about replication and where your shards are and stuff like that. And then on top of that, um, Kubernetes kind of adds a level of abstraction to that. So you don't exactly know what physical machine um, things are running on, but you know what pod it's in. And um, so it adds a layer of, of complicated um, abstraction on top of that. So the audience, they don't necessarily have to be like Redis experts, but they are like power users. Um, 
because they're using they're using kind of like a, a really advanced um, use case. But um, the nice thing is, is that I can tell them how it's like how Kubernetes does it differently than you know the regular software, and then if it's the same, then I can just refer them back to our Redis software docs, and we try to do that as much as possible um, because we don't want two completely identical sets of docs. We want to just show you what you have to do differently if you're on Kubernetes, and um, then they're getting the experience of Redis software. They it's something that they're familiar with if they've you know, worked with it before, or if they're comfortable with Kubernetes and they're just learning Redis, um, that's also a target audience. And um, so it's usually you know, um, computer administrators, um, not end users. So not like app developers. We're looking at people who are setting up an environment for developers. Right. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, then you've you've written your documentation. Do you test it on the uh, the intended audience, or you know, how do you kind of ensure that it hits the the spot for people? Um, usually, I can test it. Sometimes, um, a lot of times, there's a lot of steps before and after that um, I would get tripped up on. And so I rely a lot on my subject matter experts, my SMEs. There's another acronym for you. <laughs> um, and uh, in R&D, the people that developed it, and also in um, customer success, the people that are solving the problems and know what customers are having trouble with, um, they're invaluable to um, helping us prioritize what is what are the users experiencing because they have direct contact with them. Same thing with our solution architects. They know what people are looking for and what information they want and they're requesting. And so they can kind of convey that to us and say, well, people really want to know how to set up this and we don't have anything for that. And that really helps us get a better idea of our audience and get them more valuable information. Yeah. Yeah, I think anybody who is customer or prospect facing, so like you say, solution architects, customer success, technical support, probably developer advocates as well, mm -hmm. are a really rich source of intel for, you know, what are our users talking about? What are their pain points? I think that's probably a very important one for documentation, isn't it? Because you're trying to kind of make, make the experience smoother for people and frictionless, I guess. So just thinking back to, you know, at the moment we are remote, um, like I said, and in your previous job, I don't know whether you were remote or not, actually. Uh, were you were you working in an office then or? Yes, I was um, working in an office. It um, It's kind of a coincidence because for a really high tech company, they were in a very small town that I live in um, because uh, Seymour Cray, the father of the supercomputer. He founded Cray in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, and um, they kept their manufacturing there. And so I was able to work for this massive technology company in my small town um, that I probably would have had to been in a large metropolitan area to um, kind of get into that industry if um, I hadn't stumbled upon this and tried to, you know, make my mom happy. Um, <laughs> So we were in an office um, and it was kind of, it's, you know, it was nice because I, when I was writing hardware, I could go in, see the physical things, take video photos, talk to people. Um, and then, you know, when the pandemic hit, we all went virtual. Um, I didn't until a while later, cause I was on maternity leave. So I came back um, and yeah, so then they were virtual, and now I'm all virtual because Redis is pretty spread out. So. Yeah, yeah, and you and Lance and Rachel don't live anywhere near each other, really, do you? And I don't, I don't think anyone in our team lives locally 
to anybody. Yeah. Like there's at we, least we consider it close if you're in the same time zone, basically. On our yes, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's a whole other story. Like trying to figure out what time we're going to have our meeting. But mm -hmm. um, so, what would you say? Um, in terms of the actual role of technical writing and doing it distributed and doing it remote, is it harder to do it in a, sorry, doing it in person, like, you know, in an office and doing it distributed, is it harder to do it distributed or is it okay? I mean, everyone's had to find a way of getting their job done, but, you know, are there things that are easier with doing it in person? I, it depends on your content. So if you're, doing physical components, then it's much harder to do virtually. Um, but when I was even when I was in the office, all of my meetings, um, the people were in Seattle or in Minneapolis, um, and they were in Houston, they were scattered all over. Um, so it didn't really change a lot. Um, and the nice thing about software is that it's all it's all abstract, you know, it's ones and zeros. And it's how we um, make sense of that. So it's a lot easier to convey over um, a phone call or a chat or, um, you know, virtually, because it's, it's all virtual. So um, I didn't really see any um, stumbling blocks to going virtual for software documentation. Yeah, I was just wondering, really, because, you know, in case anyone's looking to pivot into software documentation or hardware documentation, um, from something that isn't documentation at the moment, then they might be thinking, you know, how am I going to do this remotely? So it's good to know that, you know, having done both, yes, everybody's had to adapt and you've had to adapt, but mm -hmm. actually haven't found that it's made your job hugely more difficult. Yeah, um, it's honestly, I think it's easier because people are easier to get a hold of. If they're in the physical office, then they're usually wandering around and you have to catch them at the right time that they're in their office. Um, but online, I can see who's online and who's not and who has the time to talk and who doesn't. That's true, actually. Yeah, I was talking to somebody else about this because my my sort of specialty is events and marketing and stuff like that. And uh, we were talking about if you had to organize an event and you had speakers, if it's in person and the speaker wanders off, like, how are you going to find this person? But if it's online, you might have a better chance of finding them or did they just drop off the were they there a minute ago and they're coming back, that kind of thing. So uh, it's definitely easier to pin people down sometimes in the in the online world. And we do have better tools now for remote work, most definitely. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so we're coming near the end of the hour. So I really want to find out from you some advice that you would give people who want to get into technical writing. And one of the big questions I think is, you know, how do you prove that you can do it? So, um, you know, if you've done, you've gone in as a, as somebody who didn't really know that they wanted to do technical writing, your mum made you apply for this job and then you got into the team and you got promoted. So you're, you're probably at the, the stage where, you know, you might want to hire somebody, for example. So what would you be looking for in a potential candidate to show you so that they could demonstrate that they can do the role? So a lot of people focus on, you know, what technologies they know and they have a knowledge base in. And that can kind of give you an indication that, oh, they were able to learn this technology. But um, more so the thing that I think really helped me advance is just the willingness to learn. And they would say, do you know anything about this? And I'd be like, no, but I can. Um, and they would you know, say, can you use this software? And I'm like, no, but I can learn it. Um, and just the willingness to um, adapt and learn and grow is more valuable than having an existing knowledge base. Okay. And yeah, I just, I, think if you don't have to be technical, you just have to be willing to research and learn. And it's more about the process than it is about the actual content. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Because as long as you've gone through the process and you've got got together the information and you understand it yourself, then generating the content is something, you know, you can do as an iterative process. But if you didn't have the raw materials in the first place, then you're not going to get anywhere near writing about it. So how can somebody demonstrate that? 
with the willingness to learn or, you know, I'm thinking about could they put together a portfolio? Is that something you might be looking for? Um, I think it's there's a lot of online resources for learning. There's a lot of free courses online, um, even like Redis University. If you complete a course, you can get a little badge on your LinkedIn um, and stuff like that shows that you're putting in effort to learn things. Um, so, you know, even just like a certificate and then, you know, you can confidently put that line on your resume. And I think there's just so many online resources that are free, or if you, you know, want to do the paid subscriptions and stuff, um, and just show that you're willing to put in the effort to learn about it. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of the actual writing, because yes, you know, you can be good at researching, you could be good at learning things and explaining them, maybe explaining them verbally, but presumably there is some level of um, writing skill required. Can you talk to me about that? Yes. Um, you just have to, there's a lot of writing resources online, um, like uh, Purdue University has a great um, resource and um, Google has a technical writing guide that you can look at and you can kind of learn the rules or the guidelines that you need to face, but really it's about um, editing. You have to, you know, you can go in and try to explain it and then read it back and see if it makes sense. And um, it's really about improving every time you look at it so that it's clear and um, that it's simple. And you really want to make things um, as simple as possible because then they're they're clear. So a lot of people say, like, can you explain it to a kindergartner? Um, things like that, um, that you should be able to put it into its most simple terms to convey that message. Yeah. So when you came in for the job here at Redis, did they ask you to submit any samples of your writing? Yes. Yep. I um, submitted some writing samples that I thought um, illustrated different areas. I think I did like two or three. So um, I tried to show my range that I could do more than one thing. And um, I guess they liked them. So yeah, well, you, you obviously excelled there because you got the job. But um, yeah, and you obviously you'd worked in the previous company and held a number of different roles. Like you say, you were you started off on the hardware and then you became a software writer. So I'm sure you had a lot of different um, things that you could give as a, a sample, depending on whether or not, you know, it had to be confidential because. Yeah, I was going to say, most of the things I worked on were confidential, so I couldn't use them. So I had to go back several years for stuff that had been made public. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to be from a company um, like Rachel, she submitted a, a paper that she did in college. And, you know, some people can, you can, that's the nice thing about open source is you can go in and help with documentation and you can use that as an example that you contributed. Yeah, especially if it's something that's widely used or something that you really love to use. And like you say, it's public, so the link is there and you can point people towards it. So, um, yeah, we're definitely coming up to the end of the hour now. So I just kind of want to wrap up. But one of the things I sort of get the sense from you over speaking to you for the last uh, 50 minutes is that, you know, it's very much a kind of a learning process. It's always a learning process because technology is changing so quickly. And when you get your first job in a company, then um, you're never going to know everything about that that tech that you're going to be writing about. So you're learning from day one and you're always learning because they're always adding new features and stuff like that. So what are you excited to learn about or work on next? I am really enjoying learning more about Kubernetes just because it's so complicated and very hard to or like explain. And I don't know why that's exciting, um, but uh, 
and just like our entire suite of products is always evolving and we're adding more features and um, especially like our active active feature that has a lot of um, nuances to it that create a specific challenge that I, I really like doing those types of projects where um, it's hard to explain and you find a way. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a challenge, but and you kind of think there's got to be a way of putting this um, so that a kindergartner can <laughs> understand it. Um, you just got to find it. So I can definitely see why, why you enjoy that challenge. Um, so yeah, so then final question, I guess, you're working on a lot of different things at the moment. You mentioned the, the, you know, learning about Kubernetes and stuff like that. What's coming up next for you in the, in the next few weeks or months work-wise? Do you know what's, what's next on the horizon after you've finished your current work? Well, I'll be working on Kubernetes for quite some time. Um, we still have a lot of, uh, of our backlog to get through. Um, as well as keeping up with the current releases. So we have um, a release every roughly six weeks. So I have to cover new features as well as trying to cover pain points and gaps that we have in the documentation. And, you know, as we are a small team, I am always trying to help out with um, our software and cloud products. Um, we are always just trying to find what's going to be the most useful. So um, a lot of times we get requests in from people within the company saying, hey, this is a pain point. Um, and we, we like to be really agile and um, adapt to meet those needs. Yeah, try and be accommodating, definitely. Cool. OK, well, thanks so much, Caitlin, for spending the last hour with me. It's been really interesting to hear about your career journey, because although I knew that you weren't previously a coder. I hadn't fully appreciated exactly what it was that you'd done and that you'd been promoted so many times in the last company and done so many different things. And it's just been so cool to hear that you did come in and you know there was a very clear career path for you because I think in tech that can be so mm -hmm. difficult. And um, so I think that's that will have really encouraged a lot of people that are watching um, this fireside chat. So thanks so much, Caitlin, for your time mm -hmm. today. All right, thank you. No worries. And thanks everybody for watching. Those of you on Twitch who joined us live, thanks so much for that. We always love it when people join us live. And those of you watching on YouTube as well, thanks so much for watching this video. So um, I'm gonna be back tomorrow, Tuesday the 26th of October with Rachel, who also works in the documentation team. I'm then gonna be back on Friday the 29th of October with Lance, who works in the documentation team as well. Lance is a team leader, so he will be talking to us all about the management piece as well and how he uh, he looks after the team and decides on what they're going to do and the workload and sets up all those, uh, those processes and frameworks and things like that. Those events are going to be the same time as today's event. So it's gonna be 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, 4 p.m. UTC and 5 p.m. UK. If you follow us on Twitch, you'll get a push notification when we go live. So the recording for this event will be on YouTube very soon. And we also did a panel event uh, last week, which is already on YouTube. So please do check that out. So until I see you again, look after yourself and take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye.